And maybe you can tell us a little about your early life in Brooklyn. Well, I was actually, uh, I was born in Brooklyn, but I, I more grew up on Long Island, mm. um, uh, on the South Shore, a place called the Five Towns, mm. um, really lacking in culture. So, boring actually. <laughs> so I, 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 found, I, I found my way to Manhattan. Uh -huh. my, where I lived was very close to the Long Island Railroad. Mm. It was a 40 minute uh, train ride into New York City. So by the time I was 15, I was gone. Wow. You know, and that's when I um, you know, was really open to the whole Manhattan scene. This is, we're talking about late 60s early 70s, like I graduated high school in 73. So I was, that particular era in New York was phenomenal, fantastic, mm -hmm. exciting, you know, and uh, it was like a little bit after the explosion of the modern art movement, the Art Students League in New York, and, um, you know, a lot of the great painters, uh, Franz Kleins and Pollock uh, and, uh, Rauschenberg and, you know, um, that whole clique mm -hmm. of painters mm -hmm. had their, you know, lofts uh, back when Soho, this is before what Soho is now, yeah. it was like a lot of abandoned factories uh -huh. and I actually had a place on 30th and 8th and it was a furrier's loft where they used to store fur. Wow, back in the wow. 30s and 40s. And um, I lived with uh, I had a couple of roommates. One of them was a guy named Kenny Kirkland, who was mm -hmm. like one of the greatest jazz pianists in the world. He wow. was like a mini Herbie Hancock okay. at the time. And with me, him, and this guy Jerry, we shared this, this kind of cool loft. And it was very open, very open space. And uh, Back in those days, I, I spent a lot of time hopping around galleries and, uh -huh. you know, going to all the different shows. So it was a very eclectic, amazing scene. Unbelievable. Did, uh, again, it was, it was, this was pre-Giuliani mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, gentrification. Okay. So the dirt and the filth the grit. and the sewage right. and the, the Lower East Side, Alphabet City, you needed a tomahawk. <laughs> To get out of a cab on first half. So it was a lot of danger. In a lot of danger, a lot of drugs, uh, just okay. crazy, cra amazing. Okay. You know, in retrospect, when you look back, I'm kind of surprised I'm alive to talk about it. But, but in retrospect, it's what made me who I am today. I lived through it, so. Did you the know. exposure to the music of, of your flatmate, did that oh entertain God. your artistic process as well? Uh, unbelievable. I used to paint murals on the walls. I, you know, I had Michael and Randy Brecker, the Brecker oh. brothers, Steve Gadd, one of the oh. greatest drummers in the world, used to um, play mm -hmm. in, in, in the back of the loft was uh, this open room. And uh, Kenny was, who actually went on to play with Sting. Mm -hmm. Kenny passed away, he's not here anymore, but, but back in those days, these were the top premier jazz musicians in the world, from Richie Byrack to Miles Davis, mm. you know, and everybody in between. Used to come to the loft daily wow. and, wow. Uh, and play in that room, and I would sketch and draw. And Do you go. feel that the music in some way organically helped your stream of consciousness the way you painted? Absolutely. It's to this day, it does. I, I can't, uh, I, we were talking about this yes. before, yeah. that I, I was watching a, a YouTube video of Gerhard Richter, right. who is one of my idols and heroes and you know but very german in his approach to pain he r requires demands complete silence when he paints and he paints in a suit really he's wearing a <laughs> suit he's wearing a, an armani suit with a paintbrush i'm like is this a f***ing setup but then you realize that's the way he paints i don't know he just kind of that's not, not one drop yeah uh -huh. it, it, it's it's amazing but my point was is that he likes to work in a very sterile environment. Mm, he mm. needs to hear him, the thought process. I'm the complete opposite. Mm -hmm. Music drives every painting that I create. Mm -hmm. Every painting, a lot, I, I will often name a painting after a song that wow. I'm listening to while I'm creating it. Okay. And I'll, listen, I'll repeat over and over again everything from, you know, Naima, a Miles Davis track, okay. to 
Grand Funk Railroad, you know, uh, inside out, looking out. I painted a piece the other day. Just that driving Mark Farner, tottering, mm -hmm. pounding all the, it, it, it changes the trajectory of your movements. So that environment that you grew up in, almost a courage under fire type of environment, yeah. is that very much part of your personality as Absolutely. an artist? And then I, I, I like this, you know, I've been in LA since 85, so mm -hmm. it's a long time already. I'm going on, you know, uh, and I was, I was here actually in the mid 70s. I, I used to come back and forth. But um, I'm a New Yorker. I'm a New Yorker that happens to live in LA, right. but my aesthetic, mm -hmm. my beingness is a New York guy. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I think that line and color and texture and, you know, everything that I am, that I was as a kid, is in my work. And, and then you wrote a movie, Bullet? Yeah, Bullet, I wrote, I, I wrote a movie about, Quote yeah, unquote. Broadly, okay. Uh, you know, uh, loosely based on my oh, upbringing. Um, but it was about three brothers growing up yes. together and, and dealing with, which is all true. My older brother Bart, who's gone, uh, was a, just a bad guy, a criminal. And that was played by Mickey Rourke. Mickey Rourke played my brother. And. Adrian Brody plays me, plays you. Ruby, and then the younger brother, Brian, who's right. also gone, right. was played by Ted Levine, mm -hmm. who some of you might remember is from Silence of the Lamb. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Put the lotion in the basket. Yeah. <laughs> Buffalo Bill. And the scene in the movie where Adrian Brody comes down the side of the building, is yeah. that all of my... It's, uh, somewhat, it's somewhat, well, remember, in a movie, we did a six-story brick building, right. and we were able to, to build a contraption, mm -hmm. the, the, that, that kind of a crane system that lowers Adrian down the side of the wall. Mm -hmm. That was not based in reality, because I didn't have the wherewithal back in those right. days to right. create something like that. But, um, you know, I, I, I would paint anywhere I could. Okay. On the side of a building, a, a garage door. I and once it, painted my garage door at home black, and my father drove the car when I drove the car <laughs> killed me. But um, yeah, I, you know, I, since I'm a, I just always painted everything I could. So that art, artistic eye that you had growing up, teenagers into your twenties, did that help you survive that environment? Some type of objectivity, or yeah, you, you know, the, the, I think again, looking back. Mm -hmm. I thank God for my mom because mm. she encouraged me. Mm. But other than that, you know, I came from a very macho, blue collar family. Right. Like my dad did not understand art and did not encourage me, thought I was half retarded, <laughs> even thinking about being an artist. Right. And never took me seriously. And mm. I, you know, I was always on the periphery mm. with the art. It was something that, that I kind of did on my own. Mm. Um, until I got a little older, um, because it just, I think this is a, pro a big problem, and you and I talked about this mm -hmm. before, about our kids going to the school, mm -hmm. where the art programs are just being X'd, yes. you know, and this is an American problem, right. you know, because in Europe, you yes. know, uh, art is honored, and mm -hmm. artists are honored, mm -hmm. and it's part of culture, not just Europe, mm -hmm. the rest of the world, mm -hmm. you know, art is taught in the schools, it's it's a it's it's a very big part of the curriculum mm -hmm. because again artists are honored yes and in this in America they're just not you know yes. al unless you're in one of the bigger cities you know New York is you know the greatest mm -hmm. L A has a nice art community mm -hmm. and some of the bigger cities Miami and Detroit Chicago and, but but it's not part of the curriculum. Right. You know, I mean, half the time, I, I, you know, I, I have to explain to guys my own age, you know, God forbid, yes, uh, right you know, no. they have no clue who mm -hmm. Chagall, mm -hmm. Kandinsky, Miro, mm -hmm. they might have heard of Picasso. Right. But, you know, when you start throwing out Arshad Gorky and some of the obscure, you know, biomorphists right. <laughs> and they other movements, no you know, you might as well be talking Chinese it's it's and that's sad to me that's right. sad to me because aesthetically I think you know being a human being it's, yes it's half of who we are and what we're supposed to be mm -hmm. and you know artists are um, 
if you if you had no other form of communication and all that was left was art you could trace art back to you know um, the hieroglyphics yes we were saying that you know and yeah. and and get a sense of what mm -hmm. the world was like mm -hmm. through visual imagery as opposed to you know books right you right. could just look at paintings yes and um, get a really strong sense of you know the the, the Middle Ages through mm -hmm. those mm -hmm. through the Vinci and right. Michelangelo and Raphael and all the great masters up until and again we talked about this the the time where the the whole movement changed mm -hmm. in the mid or in the early night like 1930 with the Cubist movement yes. and Picasso's yes. abstraction entered the scene. Mm -hmm. And Picasso said, I do not paint what I see, I paint what I know. And that kind of opened the whole world up to the possibilities of the concept of abstract thinking. Right. Because everything was, you know, all art was, you know, up until like the French Impressionists, you know, it, it, it had to look like something that was familiar. So when you you're know? working on a piece, do you have to feel the piece, or does it organically flow out of you? Is there is there a process? Everything starts with you. You know, you have to have a sense of composition. Mm -hmm. I think that's something that you you can go to school and you can study composition, but I, you know, you either have it or you don't. Mm -hmm. You know, it, it's it's a little more. My process is a, a little more controlled than just pure stream of consciousness. Although that, that's a big part of my style, mm -hmm. but I almost attack and sit back and let the images start to reveal themselves. You know what I mean? Yes. So it's almost like I'll always create a base layer mm -hmm. uh, with using like oil sticks, just ran just to get loose and, and move my arms. And you'd spoken to me about it's almost like a battle. You feel it's a battle. Yeah. Well, every painting is a War, okay. you know, okay. it's it's, uh, and again, uh, I, the process for me is not a pleasant one. I, I don't, I don't. I was, we were making jokes yes, about yeah. it. Like my kids were saying, "Oh, my dad loves to paint." I, I don't fucking love it. I, I, I kind of, I kind, it, it's just what I am. Mm. It's it's a sickness. It's a disease. It's that creative. I, yeah, I mean, I wake up every day, uh -huh. but like your other. Uh, Bernardo interviews yes. that I saw, mm -hmm. you know, and I, I, I mean, and, and, and Richter too. I mean, mm -hmm. what he was talking about, and most artists, you have to approach art like a job. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you're not serious about it, and you don't create a, a space for yourself and a, and some kind of schedule or structure, you have to have it. Otherwise, you're not a painter. Mm -hmm. You know, you're. It's a hobbyist. Okay. I'm a hobbyist. I dabble in painting. Right. I've done that. Right. But when you cross over, and, and remember, there's a fine line between the business of art and yes. surviving right. as an artist, mm -hmm. making whatever your income needs to be to survive, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to living in a cardboard box, because that's all you know how to do. Right. You know, in this day and age, you have to be a little more eclectic. Mm -hmm. You know, I mean, I have a, two children in mm -hmm. private school. Yes. I got a big mortgage. Yes. And I got There's to sell. Responsibilities. A lot of responsibility. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, um, I need to sell a lot of art. And I do. Right. You know, but I have to create a lot of art to sell a lot of art. And it seems that you have a diverse range of buyers as well from all different walks yeah. of life. People are interested in your work. Yeah. Bruce, is there a, a tenant or a principle that you use or a law that has helped you in your creative process over the years? The law is that there is no law. Mm -hmm. The law is to do it. It's like Nike said, just do it. You 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 know, I don't like to put restrictions on on again, I'm a very eclectic type of painter, mm -hmm. uh, which some people frown upon, but you know, creating is creating. And I'm so prolific, I, I make a hundred paintings 
in a year if I go berserk. Wow. You know, I work 80 hours a week at this, you know. Um, I don't linger on paintings. Right. I don't sit there and stare and paint. I, that's, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a process. I have to get it out. Is there quickly. an eclecticism to that? Well, what, what, what I mean by eclectic is I don't like to get pigeonholed into one particular style. Mm. In other words, I, I've done the Pollock-esque drips, but I've also, you know, added my own thing to it, you know, to, to, to make it mine. Yes. And, and again, you know, if you look at my body of work, I think I, I, think I moved through three different styles. Um, a, there's a lot of cubism and there's a lot of biomorphism, which was, you yes, know, we discussed that. You know, the Arshile, Gorky, these kind of organic shapes that, that consistently appear mm -hmm. in my pieces. Um, my palette is always similar. Mm -hmm. I'm, I've always been drawn to like more earth tones than, than real poppy colors. Um, and my line is similar. You know, I try to keep it similar. Sometimes my line is very angular and rigid, and sometimes it's very flo fluid. Flows. It flows, but it's always the same movement. Right. It's just a matter of changing the angle of the wrist. Okay. Um, I like that. So the third law of art, the law is there is no law. The law, the third law just of art, there's no it. law. So there you have it, <laughs> Bruce Rubenstein's third law. The law is there is no law, just do it. This is Philip DeClaire. Thank you very much, Bruce Rubenstein. My pleasure.